You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Full video version of this episode of Socks in the Basement up on YouTube on Monday, uh, but on Saturday and Sunday, you're just listening into it as an audio podcast like we normally do. For those using YouTube who aren't blind, sorry. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Apologize in advance. This episode is brought to you by Cork and Carry at the Park. You heard the ad at the beginning of the show, and uh, it's one of my favorite places to be, and I love the food, and like I said last time, the, the Buffalo chicken uh, egg rolls. Oh, so good. Stupid good. Yes. I mean, like, that's the thing. Like, I was like, ah, I'm just going to get something little. And I found, like, a new favorite on there. And the burgers win awards. And, and and the price is right. Like, bring the family over. Get them fed. Do, you know, have yourself a beer. You know, try something at the bar. They got specialty drinks. The staff is really attentive. You know, like, I think people worry going to some place before the game. Will I make it in there in time? Because I don't want to miss a pitch. And why would you care why with this team? Why would you want to miss it? I'm, right. I'm but, trying to miss pitches. <laughs> but you're not going to miss a the pitch. The White Sox are missing plenty of pitches for you. Right. Don't worry. But you're not going to miss a pitch. No. You're not no, going to miss a pitch no. because they move really quick. They get the food out to you. They get the drink. They get you to check. You're out the door. You feel good. You don't have to go around the ballpark and search for something you might not be able to find. Exactly. And you have a wonderful time. Uh, it's your home game for pregame, uh, home home base, home base for pregame, postgame, and in-game viewing parties. Uh, Cork and Carry at the park. See more at CorkandCarry.com. It's also brought to you by Bourbon today. Hey, because you had a day, my friend. Bourbon, what you start drinking after the plumber comes over. And uh, uh, unclogging a drain turns into a thousand dollars, because that's <laughs> I, that's how plumbing works, though. Isn't it, it? I, I mean, and walked into the house and said, "Why are there so many holes in your wall?" Yeah, <laughs> what's with the holes, buddy? Because you know? you're all proud. You 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 covered what very right nicely with a picture. Oh, no, it I looks d- it looks good there. <laughs> I mean, it's completely out of place in your kitchen, but it looks good there. But you were so proud of the job you did covering one of the holes. And it was just like, well, first of all, how many holes are, are not covered? There are holes and everywhere. secondly, and then you showed me how many holes are not covered. This, and holy cow. This was the final gift from my ex. From all the years that she washed stuff down the drain thinking there was a garbage disposal and not caring. Right? And when she, when she just took the, the food and just like washed it down the drain. And I always said, you know, one day. This is going to be a real problem, right? And, and then, and, and then today is that day. <laughs> she refused to use. She refused to use Dawn, which like really eats up grease, right? Right. She didn't like using Dawn because it hurt her hands. What did she use? Palmolive, oh. which is not the same stuff. But I'm sorry still, if I've started something between the two soaps. A, a, a Palmolive and right, Dawn versus Dawn, right? War, but, yeah. but she wouldn't do it. But there were a lot of factors, and I used to say for years and years and years, one day this is going to cost me a ton of money with you washing all this stuff down the drains. And unfortunately, it happened after the house became what became mine because now I'm dealing with it. So this guy comes over and he tries to clear the drain and he snakes the drain and he gets everything out. And when everything comes out, so does part of the pipe. Yep. <laughs> then, then I had a waterfall. As they do. Then I had a waterfall in the basement. And then, As you do. And then he came back and he's like, I'm going to I'm gonna have to poke a hole in here to get to this, to find where this is. I think it's right here at this joint. And when he knocks in the hole... He finds not only the the problem with the pipe, but he finds a a ventilation pipe that lets all the stuff out through your roof. I didn't realize pipes, piping did this. Yeah, to get all the sewer gas out so you don't have to just deal with the smell. That's detached from where it should be because it wore down over years and years and years. That's not, that was caused by something completely different. That's just an old house. And then when he went to fix that, the rest of the ventilation pipe fell in the wall because it was detached higher up. Right. Where the cabinets were. Lo and behold, at the end of the day, there were a lot of holes in the kitchen. <laughs> a lot of holes in the kitchen. He, uh, You told me he's not quite done. He kept apologizing. Yeah. He kept going, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry about all the money this is going to cost. <laughs> and so it's been a day. So it's going to be a fun socks in the basement. I may step on some people's toes. I, I have a few thoughts over stuff that I've seen on, the, uh, on, on White Sox Twitter and social media and what I've seen with the team over the last couple of days. And I want to dive into it. And the first thing I want to dive into is Jonathan Cannon. After I sat there and said he'll probably give up 10 runs 
in the last show. Oh, no, he did and not. No, he did not. And no, that, he looked good. That's a pitcher. Yeah. Remember when I, I, I yeah. did also say he's so close to being one of those guys that gets his whip down below 1.30, and that's how you see consistency in keeping guys off base, and he did more than that. And, and I did tweet out that night during that game, the Sox in the Basement uh, account tweeted out that if you do have a Jonathan Cannon, who's just a professional pitcher, who's going to be part of your rotation, and you have Garrett Crochet for two more years, and you have Eric Fetty for one after this season, why not at least consider the idea with Drew Thorpe here now? And 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 you have so many other pitchers that are right on the cusp. you got guys that are coming. MLB Pipeline put out an article two days ago saying that the next guy up from AA should be Mason Adams. And I, I haven't really even been following this guy. No, I, I, I know who you're talking about. Like, I know the name. Right, another pitcher, though. That, like, we've been talking about throwers and pitchers. And they describe him as a guy who's using a low 80s downer curveball with a tremendous feel for pitching, pacing the Southern League with a 6.4 strikeout to walk ratio, a 2.34 ERA and 70 strikeouts in 69 and a third innings. And they're like, he should make the next jump from double A straight to the majors. You have all this pitching. Would you consider the idea that after you buy out Moncada and Jimenez and you have the money left over, even if you count the $8 million it's going to cost to buy the two of them out, if you can't trade one of them before the deadline, right? Even if you got to spend that $8 million, you still have $32 million coming off the books with them. You don't need to increase the payroll with the old man. You can keep it at 80 or $85 million, and you can add a couple of bats, bring in a manager that plays the best players and knows how to utilize them better than what he's doing, forcing guys with terrible batting averages who can't get on base aren't doing anything into the top five slots because of what they're making or because well i think that it'll all work out in the end and they're a pillar I, of the line right right exactly like 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 if you had somebody in there who actually knew what they were doing you had a young staff you bought a few bats you could still develop you still have edgar Carr on the way you still have colson montgomery coming soon you have all this young pitching you don't need to burn it down to the ground or tear it down to the studs. You can have Luis Robert Jr. out there and have him for the next three years. And I posed that, and I got a response from our good friends over at the 108. Beef and Loaf. I, I, I don't normally did, talk about the Mr. other guys Loaf on the podcast. Say. And I and I, and I love them. And yeah, I go oh yeah. out there and visit them from time to time. Uh, saying, well, I looked at all the free agents and there's there's no hitters. Oh, no, no, no. And I, I beg to disagree. No, I, there, no, There no, may no, not no. be the hitters that are flashy, but there are hitters. Right. And and I didn't want, I don't like to go back and forth on Twitter, so I'll do it on the show. Yeah, it's easier this way because he can't respond directly. <laughs> right. But, but, but no, I, 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 I take beef with Beef Loaf on this one. Okay. Um, Who, I mean, like right off the top of your head, first name that kind of pops up when you look at the free agent list that you're like, that's a, that's a gettable guy under $10 million. Because let's say, let's say you can get three guys at $10 million or less yeah. or around $10 million yeah, or less. Somewhere you there. have the money for that. Is there somebody that pops up right away? Because I had a name that popped into my head immediately when I read that. So here's the thing. You're, you're looking at guys that are not necessarily flashy but maybe have upside, or you're looking at guys that are not necessarily flashy but are consistent and productive, right? So two names popped into my head when, when you posed this question to me earlier. One is Ha-Song Kim, who is a very productive middle infielder and a good defender, uh, good on the base pass for the Padres. Batting average, not great. I will, I will grant you that. He is not a high-producing guy, but he is an upgrade over Nicky Lopez, and he has been better with a good lineup than you know what you might expect. Okay, so he's he's a guy that you could bring in, but the guy that I really would want to take a flyer on is Tyler O'Neill, who started the year with the Red Sox being very, very good and was very, very good with the Cardinals last year, has a little bit of a hard time staying healthy, which is kind of familiar to White Sox fans, but he's a guy that you could get cheap, and if you can keep him on the field, he's a guy that could also turn around and give you pretty good dividends because he's also a very good outfield. Who I want right away that I thought of, because I said, okay, you're not getting Juan Soto. No, and, you're, and, you're and not, honestly, I don't think you need a Juan Soto on this team. Right, and you're not paying $24 million for Teoscar Hernandez like the Dodgers did. You're, right, you're not doing and, and that. he's having a, a comeback year, so you're right. not going to get him on you're, the You're cheap. not doing it. But look at Baltimore. Look at all the stars I have. Look at how they've I, got I to make room for. for these prospects. And look at an Anthony Santander, who's had an 800 OPS for the last two seasons, who is, what, making $11 million yeah. this year? And I don't think, 
you know, he's gonna he's gonna add 25 home runs. He's gonna he's gonna stand out in the outfield and be a good serviceable hitter. Okay. He's going to yeah. be a top five in your lineup. One through five, he's going to sit there. He's going to sit higher than ben, Benintendi. Yes. Like he, and, and he's, you're stuck with Benintendi. I get that. But, and I know you've got a lot of young outfielders. But what I'm saying is if you get to an $80 million payroll and you're able to add these bats and Benintendi doesn't work out, so be it, man. You, you're, you're like, you're like a sunk cost at this point. If you can have an $80 million payroll right. and he doesn't earn his way onto the roster, but other guys, the young guys are taking his role, I would add an outfielder because Santander can go move over to first base because you're going to see, if you're realistic, Sheets or Vaughn, one of them has to go. You, There's no room for both. There's no room for both Unless of these guys. Unless it's a strict platoon, no. but you're not doing that. Sheets has dropped right back down to replacement level right. at best, and, and Vaughn is on a heater right now, but even if he does average out to what he's done over the first 1500 major league at bats before this season replacement level player. So you don't need two replacement level first baseman forcing one of them into the outfield. When an, when an Anthony Santander sitting out there that upgrades over both of them, he's better than both of them and right. he can play right. right field more competently and he can stand over at first and he can move into the DH role. So that's a guy that I think you can get for about 10, 11 million dollars, maybe 12, but that's affordable with what the White Sox will have if they're just looking for bats next year because they have the pitching. Another Oriole guy that falls into that category is Ryan O'Hearn, who has been you know quietly pretty good, right? And and he's a guy that can also outfield first base. So you have options amongst those guys. But you know the other thing too is you don't necessarily have to look into free agency that hard, okay? Because one of the things that you're you're looking at is are, are there are there assets that are on the team right now that are going to be traded. And are there guys maybe that we are assuming are gone, but maybe they get to stick around? I, th- there's nothing saying Paul DeYoung doesn't have a spot on this team next year. Oh, I don't think he wants to be here, though. I, I don't think he, he ain't wants coming to be back here and either. Pedro's the manager. No. No, I agree like with you. Like, the veterans around this team will never step back onto this team if this mope is running the team. I, and, and that's probably true, okay? But as, you know, just as a matter of business, let's assume that Pedro's replaced— Let's assume that Chris Getz can smooth that over with some of the veterans that are already on the team. There's nothing saying, and, and even if you trade them away, there's nothing saying that you can't make them an offer to come back if if they're willing to do so. That's always going to be a question. The other part of this is that when you do, if you do go and trade Paul DeYoung, if somebody wants a shortstop right now who is a contender and who needs a guy like him to step in because he is a professional hitter, because he is having a rebound year, and would make sense. I mean, I, you know, the Yankees might consider that. Glaber Torres, who's another guy that's on their free agent list, is having a terrible year. DJ LeMahieu is having a terrible year. They need help in the infield, and Paul DeYoung would fit what the Yankees do. Is there a hitter in the Yankee system that is ready to go that they don't trust that they're willing to sit there and say, okay, White Sox, take him? And one of the guys is right now he's playing first base for him because Anthony Rizzo is hurt, and that's Ben Rice. And that's a guy that is a catcher first baseman that you maybe target that guy and sit there and go, well, what would it take for me to get this left-handed bat off of you? This guy who's hit well in the minor leagues, who's major league ready, who I could put as my first baseman, who might have a chance to be above average, certainly better than what Gavin Sheets and, and, and Andrew Vaughn have shown, or a guy that I could put, you know, match with Corey Lee behind the plate and work into the DH role. I'm not saying Ben Rice is the answer, but I'm saying that there are hitters out there. If you look at other teams, there are always going to be guys, the Orioles are a huge example of that, there's going to be guys that can be successful, that you can acquire, that you don't have to worry about the free agent market, especially if if the rumors are true and Major League veterans don't want to come to the White Sox. Sox in the basement listeners and viewers, if you're on YouTube uh, hey. from Monday on, uh, if for exterior windows, doors, patio doors, storm doors, look no further than Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. No high-pressure sales. They're not in your kitchen. Uh, you're in their showroom. Uh, you get to see everything in, in full living color. You get to, to check it all out. That's the next thing I got to fix. We, we, had a, uh, we had a graduation party for my daughter, and some idiot teenager thought you open up the window by pressing on it. What? Who does that? I, there wasn't any alcohol involved. They're, they're 18 years old. Just stupid. Just dumb. Just okay. stupid. So I have, I have a window that needs to be replaced now. So I'm, I'm stopping in there. I think this weekend. Wait, that was the, the plan. Here's the good news. <laughs> <laughs> if they take that window out, there's very little chance another window just falls off. I don't know. After yeah. the plumbing thing, who knows? 
Who knows? I just know that if I go to Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest, they're going to take care of it. They're going to take good care I of it. I trust you. them. Yes. Okay. Uh, owners in showroom, owner on the site, uh, all Window and Door Superstore installers. They don't farm out the work. They've been doing it for 40 years in Oak Forest since 1985 with all major brands, custom made and no stock items for a perfect fit. A half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280, 159th Street. You go there this weekend, you might see me. You may you may well, see you me go. in there this weekend. See more at Window Door Oak Forest. Dot com. I, I thought about a guy that came available to, and, and I'm not saying you get this guy specifically because somebody's going to say, oh, come on, he's not having that great of a season. There's a reason he got released. Right. But these types of guys are the same types of guys that Tommy Pham was, right? Guys that like you, you, you need professional scouting. And you, this is something the White Sox have lacked forever, but you have different guys in the front office now that are making decisions. I, I remember in the offseason when Getz got in there, there was almost like a bloodletting of guys who were just Kenny guys. And they're not in there anymore. And you have guys that were not Kenny guys. So you're hoping there's a better identification of players. And they, they well, did well Josh, with Fam, and they did well with the young. Isn't that what Josh Barfield's supposed to be doing? Right. So like they didn't miss on everybody this year. They, they didn't get everything they wanted, but they, they did identify a couple of bats at a low cost they could bring in. So I look at a guy like J.D. Davis. Uh, yeah. That's when you don't name. know whether or not Brian Ramos is going to be really ready, who can play third base who is, you know, he's had a couple seasons recently where the OPS lingers right around 800, where he plays a competent third, where he can kind of move yeah, around, he's, he's a little versatile. He he got released because they they picked up a, a, a bigger name. And so he got released, got picked up right away. He's a little off this year in his stats. Well, he went to Oakland. Who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be off? <laughs> I mean, come okay? on. You're suddenly in Oakland. Uh, I'd the, be off. Yeah, I mean, that's rats like are, having a hole punched in your body. Yeah, they, they, rats, they, are, they, rats are like eating your shoe off <laughs> while you're at the plate in, in Oakland Coliseum. Right, but I look at a guy who's been a professional hitter who when he has a down year, he's not, he's not a detriment to your team. He just becomes replacement level. And he seems to kind of move in ebbs and flows. Like, you know, like in, in 2021 20, and 22, he's killing out there. And then he kind of had like a little bit of a drop off in the back half of 22. Uh, with the Mets, he wasn't as good as he was with the Giants. So actually, at the beginning of the year, he was a little bad. And then he got going with the Giants and he had a great second half with them and, and, and a really good season the next year with them. That, that's a guy who's a professional hitter. And I'm not saying that that's the guy you go get. But that's a guy you scoop for four million dollars, well, you know, and, 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 and that's the, guy, the thing you can grab two four million dollar hitters and, and a twelve million dollar Anthony Santander, and you can you can maybe bring DeYoung back if you decide. And you can craft a team of guys that aren't blocking players that are young, but make them make them accomplish something if they're going to get up there, right? Make a guy like Nicky Lopez, who's just the Naperville kid, be worth starting every day. And hitting in the two hole like he was on Friday night, you know, explicably he was hitting exactly. in the two hole. Like, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, no. Some of the decision making makes no sense. So you can you can jettison some of these players. Look, I said I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Major League Baseball GMs have to be heartless, and you cannot be married to guys just because you drafted them, acquired them in a trade, or 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 signed them to a deal. They're just pieces. Some of your pieces are going to work. And every team has pieces that don't work. Every team has free agents that you sign that don't work. Every team has draft picks that don't work out, if, even if they were highly touted. Every team every makes team. a trade, and then they look back every one day and team. say, it didn't work out. The biggest problem the White Sox have is they're so pompous. They're so full of themselves. And their owner is so angry when he has to pay somebody who's not starting on the field. He gets so angry about it that they don't admit their mistakes and move on. Good teams, I think you can look at most rosters over the last 20 years, have a player that underperforms, makes way too much money, and becomes a role player, essentially, because they found somebody else who doesn't make a lot of money, who beats them out for the job. Well, Jason Hayward on the 2016 oh, Cubs. Jason Hayward. If I, want to pick, if I want to pick a team that won a championship in the last 10 years that most Chicago fans will remember... If the Cubs treat Jason Hayward like the White Sox would have treated him, they never make it to the World Series. And Jason Hayward on every team he's been on since he came into the major leagues, he's always been a little overrated and overpaid. Ever since Atlanta overpaid him, and then the Cubs overpaid him, and then the Dodgers are overpaying him. But you're right about that. But here's the other hubris that the White Sox have when it comes to this. 
every acquisition doesn't have to be the long-term answer, okay? There is something to be said about having a couple of spots on your roster, sometimes maybe even half the lineup, of guys that aren't necessarily going to be around long-term, that aren't signed to five-year deals, that aren't signed to two-year deals for that matter, okay? There, you can get guys in every single year who you expect to contribute to your team that are replaceable by another guy that you can bring in that does the exact same thing that you can expect to, to be a professional hitter. We, you know, we mentioned Anthony Santander and Ryan O'Hearn. Basically, two guys that kind of fill the same role, right? So if you don't get one, but you get the other, maybe you've lost out a little bit, but it's the same kind of idea, right? And they're both being successful right now with the, with the Orioles, and they're both having you know good professional years. J.D. Davis is another guy. He's not a guy that you're going to invest in long term, okay? You don't have to do this. What you have to do is you have to, every year, put together a lineup that you feel like is going to be competitive, and if it means that Colson Montgomery is not ready next year, so you bring back a Paul DeYoung, and, and if he's willing to do so, and I'm, I, you know, then that's fine. But he doesn't have to. Paul DeYoung doesn't have to be. We don't have to sit here and debate whether or not he's a guy you want to sign for five years. We have to debate whether or not he's the type of guy you want to bring back on another one year deal because you're not sure Montgomery starts the season, or you want to make him earn it. Or if you're trying to fill outfield spots, you don't have to worry about whether or not. It's Luis Robert Jr. and a couple of his running buddies that are going to be this all-star trio for the next five years. It doesn't have to be that. He could have a different right fielder next to him every year that he's with the White Sox, and it would be fine as long as they're producing. It just doesn't matter. It's the same backup catchers. It's the same thing. We got so used to in the Kenny and, and Rick era that every acquisition was the man. Right, well, that's the problem. Every, you know, acquisition, every acquisition was going was to be the, a superstar, yeah. and we can never admit. Look at this. We can never admit when somebody isn't any good, and that's the only way that Chris Getz could ever make me believe that he's different. And, and well, that's why I thought he was different this year. That's why I thought I, so too. I but looked at what he was doing, and he was bringing in guys on one-year deals, on prove-it deals. But he's a hostage right now. His yeah. owner won't let him get rid of. Pedro. The thing that's holding everything He made everything those back. comments. And it was so obvious. He had every opportunity to sit there and say earlier in the week, this is my guy. I believe in him. I like what we're doing. He gave him no endorsement whatsoever. He does not want him. That's why he went into no, hiding. He no. was forced to go out there and talk. He probably was saying, I don't have time today until somebody said, you have to go out there. You have no choice. And speak. And he didn't want to. I mean, look, I, look I don't care if the guy... If the guy's qualified to be a GM or not, I don't know if he's any good at it. I don't know what the what the end result is going to be with him. And he may fail. I mean, there's a lot of things pointing to the fact that he may fail. That's true. He may, he may work out. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know this. No matter what he is, no human being on the face of this earth wants to go out there and sit there and try to explain something that they don't believe in. And you could see that. You could see he didn't believe in it. And he also doesn't want to be called a liar. Like, no. Because we've well, called him it and everybody else that. is calling him it. Because he said, I'm going to do it this way, and he's not doing it that way. He wants to say, my owner won't let me do it. But right. you don't want to know why he can't say it? can't say it because he'll never get a job in Major League Baseball as long as Jerry Reinsdorf is alive. Not only will he no. not work for the White Sox, he won't be anywhere. And I want to get into the whole Jerry thing because I was disgusted, disgusted by an article that came out. In one of the newspapers, I, I can't even believe they still print them, in one of the newspapers this week. Before I get to that, uh, Sox in the Basement listeners, here's the deal. When you combine State Farm Home and Auto Insurance, you save an average of $889. And State Farm agent John Harrell is ready to help you combine home and auto and save in Chicagoland. Give him a call today, 708 481 4,500, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Average annual per household savings based on a 2019 national survey by State Farm of new policyholders who reported savings by switching to State Farm. And it was the Sun-Times. The Sun-Times put out an article. Oh, the Sun-Times. Jeff Agrest wrote an article. The Sun-Times Twitter account po posted this thing, and this is what they said. To White Sox chairman Jerry Reinsdorf's credit. I, 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 I had to stop for a second. I, I'm just, uh, I'm sure his credit's great, by the way. Uh, he's, he's a billionaire, so. And they put in parentheses, how many times has that been said? <laughs> the NBC Sports Chicago postgame show has been candid and critical about what might be a historically bad season, 
column by Jeff Agrest in the Sun Times. Now, there's okay. a lot in that tweet. First, there is an admission that Jerry Reinsdorf completely controls everything that comes out that was on NBC Sports Chicago. Right there for you, in case the, you were the wondering. The corporate podcast, if you no. thought I was making that up, no. it was right there. Right there for it's you. It's right there. They don't get to say anything unless Jerry lets them say it. It's right, right there. That's, that, is a, that is the Chicago Sun-Times telling you that in that tweet. If you don't believe it. If you don't believe us. It's right there. Believe the Sun-Times. <laughs> okay. Now, what I can't believe about the Sun-Times is that they wrote that dribble. Because it would only be true if they were talking about the real problem on the team, which is the owner of the uh, team. Yes. Right? Like, you can make fun of Pedro because you know he's a dead man walking. Even Jerry knows he's a dead man walking. Jerry, Jerry knows just, he's firing him. Jerry's yes. got an internal policy of I don't sign pitchers for more than three years. Which is asinine. Okay. I don't give $100 million contracts out. Which is stupid. Okay. I always hire internally because I like to be comfortable with the people that are around me. It's a choice. Okay. And Jerry Reinsdorf does not keep managers or does not fire managers until they have one year left. Right. That's his last policy. And Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't let NBC Sports say anything bad about Jerry about Reinsdorf. About Jerry Reinsdorf or really Jerry about the organization Re- right. itself. Jerry Reinsdorf's been on the radio before and somebody asked him a question and he literally said on the air, I will never come back on your radio station again. Right. Like, I mean, th- that is how Jerry Reinsdorf operates. So the stupidity, I know that we don't have enough sports stories to fill newspapers, even though nobody's buying them. I know that, right? Yeah, there's only so many things you can say I about know, a bad Bulls I team. I know and, that, but yeah. guess what? This, that is a stu- that is stupid. The well, idea that we're giving Jerry Reinsdorf credit for allowing state media to pick on a guy who even Jerry Reinsdorf knows he's going to fire, he just doesn't want to do it this year. And acting like you can give him credit for that when Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't allow these guys to actually talk about the systematic problems on the team. No, and then they get close. That, they get close, the but they never do it. They get close, but they never do it. They talk about what's going on in their front office now. You, you'll get like what Ryan McGuffey will do it on the corporate podcast every once in a while. He gets all fired up. But where is the Jerry Reinsdorf's a, a crappy owner? Because everybody knows that's what it is, and you can't do that. And I don't, I don't fault him for it. I don't fault him for it. I don't fault Chuck for it. I don't fault Gene Honda for it because he announces the games. I, and, he won't, and Gene won't come on my show, even though I've met Gene. I know Gene. We're alums of the same radio station in Champaign. He used to walk up and talk to me before I did this podcast like we were old friends. And now Gene doesn't want to talk to me because I am persona non grata because I talk about his boss and I get it. I don't fault him at all for it. But I'm telling you right now that you can't write that headline with a straight face. That is ridiculous to me. Let's wrap this show up with the Sox nerd. Dave Marin has all those tidbits up on the scoreboard, and he's got some for you right now. Brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the Village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore, and see everything they have going on this weekend and beyond at LamontDowntown.com. Nerd, what do you got for me? Chris, the late Willie Mays was a lifetime National Leaguer, so his history with the White Sox is limited. However, thanks to Comiskey Park, spring training, and the All-Star Game, we can link the Say Hey Kid, who died on Tuesday, to our White Sox. Mays faced the Sox in exhibitions a handful of times. The earliest one I could find was a March 19, 1952 tilt between the Giants and the Sox in Pasadena, California. On that day, the Sox got a good dose of the complete Mays as he singled, scored, and stole a base in the New York Giants' 4-3 win. Four years prior to that, Mays made the first of his two appearances at Comiskey Park. On August 29, 1948, Mays, then 17, was the starting left fielder for the Birmingham Black Barons in their 5-4 win over the Chicago American Giants in the first game of a Negro League doubleheader before 4,500 on the south side. I wish I could tell you how Mays did, but stats from that game are incomplete. What is known about that game was that the winning pitcher was Bill Greason, who threw out the ceremonial first pitch at Thursday's Rickwood Classic in Birmingham. 35 years later, Mays made his other appearance at the Old Park. In an old-timers game, the day before the 50th anniversary All-Star Game at Comiskey Park, Mays batted third and played center field for the National League. 
Hitting between Ernie Banks and Eddie Matthews, Mays was 0 for 2 and scored a run on a Joe Torre single in the National League's 6 to 5 win. In between those appearances, Mays had a few All Star encounters with Sox personnel. For example, Mays got the first of his All Star record 23 hits off the Sox Bob Keegan in the 1954 game in Cleveland, and Willie was the first of Sox rep Gary Peters' four strikeouts during his three perfect innings in the 67 game in Anaheim. Also, Willie gloved Sox rep Luis Aparicio's fly for the final out of the 1962 game in Washington, D.C. With Mays' passing, it is now Aparicio who is the oldest living Hall of Famer. Before I get to my zinger, a reminder, you can access my blog at SoxInTheBasement.com and there is plenty of Sox nerd material on Twitter and on the scoreboard at Guaranteed Rate Field. My zinger? Jonathan Cannon pitched into the ninth inning in his sixth major league start in the Sox 2-0 win over Houston. The last Sox pitcher to go deeper into a game that early in a career was when Wilson Alvarez went the distance against Cleveland in his sixth major league start on September 1st, 1991. The last Sox righty to go deeper into a game than Cannon earlier in a career was Bill Long, who fired a two-hitter against the Yankees in his fifth game on May 5th, 1987. That's it. More than you probably wanted to know about Willie Mays, Comiskey Park, Bob Keegan, and the Cannon. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.